Okay, now we're going to move on to implementation strategies, which has been a huge focus in the field of implementation science in recent years. Uh, so when we think about implementation strategies, so there's been kind of this distinction. I think historically, when we heard about diffusion of research or interventions, this was often just kind of passive, again, unplanned spread of information. So again, our you know historically, a lot of researchers would just publish their findings, present at conferences, um, and kind of just passively spread the word about their interventions. Dissemination, again, is like we talked about, a really focused um, approach in trying to encourage the widespread adoption and use of specific evidence-based programs or guidelines, again, to a specific audience. So again, we have our school system example, so making sure that all the New York City principals know about this new HIV intervention and that we're testing actively testing specific messages or strategies to encourage that adoption. And then implementation, again, is about that active approach. So it's really about, again, once they've agreed to adopt it, then what are the strategies to actually ensure that they can integrate and actually deliver what the intervention is? You know, the, the principal could say, yes, I'm on board, our school's gonna do this. But then that's very different than actually making sure that the teachers are actually prepared that they're trained, that they're equipped, that they can problem solve, that they have the ownership and support and resources and knowledge and self-efficacy to actually deliver it. Um, that the school system has, you know, not just the principal on board who might be the one who, you know, officially says that they're gonna deliver it, but that you have all the administrative and organizational leadership on board, that you have the support of the parents and the students. So again, implementation is really about on the ground, making sure that it actually is delivered. So some early work in the field um, to 2005, um, there was an implementation uh, synthesis review, which suggested that implementation was most successful in organizations when carefully selected practitioners, you know, received coordinated training, coaching, and frequent kind of performance assessments, that the organizational infrastructure and context was understood so that you could um, address any barriers or challenges that might arise, that the leadership was on board, and that communities and consumers, or you know, whoever that might be um, in your particular setting, were fully involved in the selection. And again, that the policy, uh, my, the policy level and context um, would support or facilitate or provide the conditions uh, for implementation. Um, so this is kind of great, broadly speaking, but then when we actually want to think about promoting and planning implementation and having actual strategies, what, what should we actually do? So this is when implementation strategies um, have really started to be developed and tested. Um, so again, we have our evidence-based intervention on the left. We talked about kind of the selection of that. That's the what, that's kind of the thing that we often say. Um, the how is the implementation strategies. That's okay, we have the curriculum, we have the program to promote physical activity. We have some level of evidence, we have the buy-in, we, we, you know, they've agreed to adopt it. But then again, how do we actually implement this on the ground? And again, we talked about implementation outcomes and the range of those. Again, we're often looking at our implementation strategies and whether they're effective or successful in relation to things like feasibility, fidelity, acceptability, um, penetration or adoption, sustainability, uptake, and costs. So again, let's look a little um, more deeply at what implementation strategies are. So the definition, so By Byron Powell has been really a leader in this area. Um, his work has defined implementation strategies as um, a systematic intervention process to adopt and integrate evidence-based health innovations into usual care. And that's a bit of a more clinical or kind of health systems definition, but you can think about kind of the same type of strategy for community and public health settings. So, you know, examples might be everything from, you know, training and workshops, manuals, curricula, implementation toolkits, you know, supervision, coaching, feedback, technical assistance, you know, incentives. There's lots of potential strategies. The approach here, though, and the distinction is really that this is something that's done actively 
and that really are trying to understand which strategy or combination of strategies works in a specific setting or context. And we'll talk about selecting that um, in just a minute. But again, this is often informed by your stakeholders, what's feasible, and the specific context and setting. So Byron Powell and colleagues have put implementation strategies into these six categories. This is called the ERIC taxonomy. There's some nice references here. Um, and there are 72 strategies, so there are a lot. Um, so broadly, they're lumped into these categories of planning strategies. So these are about you know, gathering data, building buy-in, developing relationships, um, education types of strategies. So these are about you know, training curriculum, um, informing stakeholders, providing um, opportunities for building knowledge and capacity. Um, finance, so opportunities for thinking about providing incentives. Sometimes these are financial, but sometimes other um, types of incentives. Um, training, support. So what kind of at the systems level needs to be in place to support this? What's the infrastructure? Um, restructuring, so this might be um, changing job definitions or roles, um, thinking about clinic workflow or um, departmental or organizational workflow, staffing, the physical structures, um, things like, you know, if it requires electronic health records, what does that look like in a setting that might not have that um, data tracking and, and evaluation. Quality management, so again, opportunities for kind of incentivizing, training, and supportive, um, you know, that might relate to looking at kind of social norms within a setting and, you know, if you have um, what, what the kind of average number of referrals are for providers within a certain setting for colorectal cancer screening referral and then comparing, providing some kind of social norm around that and incentivizing them and comparing them with kind of what, what other providers look like at their setting um, and nationally. So that's kind of an, an opportunity for quality management that we've seen in more clinical settings. And then attending to the policy context. So this is all about, you know, again, through a policy levels, are, are there ways to incentivize? You know, maybe it's about Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement. Maybe it's about um, licensing or accreditation. Maybe it's about ways of thinking about bringing in health equity and, um, as some of the in community involvement, as um, some of the incentives um, that are attended to in the policy content. So we've seen that in uh, with hospital accreditation, for example. Um, so again, this is another potential strategy to kind of align and encourage implementation of certain practices or interventions. So this is a bit more detailed and kind of provides some specific examples. So I'm not going to go into um, all of these, but again, they're lumped into these kind of nine different categories. And I encourage you um, to kind of familiarize yourself if you're interested in this, um, what these look like. And again, this is just even more detailed. So all these references are, you know, at the bottom. But again, there's lots of examples. And really where we are as a field is really trying to understand for different types of settings, uh, for different types of interventions, for different types of populations, are there some strategies that make more sense than others? Are there some that are more effective? Are there some that are more feasible? So that's really where the, we don't have a lot of empirical evidence in this, but this is where the interest is um, in the field. And um, as a researcher who does a lot of work in community settings, that um, do, I do a lot of work on health equity. What I'm really interested in is thinking about, are there certain types of strategies that might be more effective in addressing health inequity? So for example, the ones that relate to you know, relationships, building a coalition, developing partnerships, um, conducting local consensus and discussion, identifying and preparing champions, involving family members. So again, are there, way, are there certain strategies that might be more feasible, appropriate, and actually more effective for promoting health equity in some of the settings that we're working in? A lot of these, I think, have come in through a lot of the clinical landscape, but I think it's important for those of us who are doing work in community settings to think about, are there ones that are missing for the settings we're working in? Again, we are the experts, you are the experts in your settings. So always um, thinking about, from your own lens, knowing your population, knowing your setting, what you think um, from your conversations, from your stakeholder engagement, 
um, is feasible and effective and not just feeling like you have, you know, the literature says this, so I have to do this. So again, I think we don't know a lot in this area. So I think this area is really, really wide open. So always think about, again, involving your stakeholders in, in selecting these, looking at existing evidence, but again, we don't have a lot, thinking about opportunities for bringing in theory. So maybe there, um, you could use something like the consolidated framework for implementation research for understanding some of the potential barriers and facilitators in, in your setting, and then maybe try and match those with some of the implementation strategies. Um, and then context, again, what's feasible? Some of these, you know, fin providing financial incentives, aligning with policy, these strategies might not be feasible. Um, so what is feasible within your context? I think that's the part that's so important. We don't want to be doing, we don't want to be recreating the wheel and developing a whole set of implementation strategies that aren't going to be feasible for people to use. So I think learning from you all in settings about what's feasible, appropriate, um, and effective um, is, is really where I hope the field will go. So again, there are frameworks like CIFR, like I mentioned, that you can use to help you think about possible selection of these strategies. Again, there's, we're starting to see some empirical evidence, but I do think that there's just a huge gap here in terms of what we know. So I think there's the opportunity to, to do some pilot work and some really innovative work to understand this. Um, Byron Powell and Maria Fernandez and others have started using um, tools like interve intervention mapping to think about selection of strategies. Um, on the CIFR website, CIFRguide.org, they're starting to help make some of the links between possible barriers and facilitators and strategies. But again, I think there's a little bit of art and science here and we still don't know a lot. Um, so I think this area um, is an important and innovative one where we have huge gaps in understanding. Here's an example of, of how you might think about making that connection between some of the barriers that you've identified and some of the strategies. So if you find that low knowledge from the practitioners, um, maybe it's the teachers who are gonna be delivering the HIV prevention curriculum. If, if low knowledge is identified as a huge barrier, you know, education um, and technical assistance might be a good option in terms of the implementation strategy. If it's that um, you know, providers think that they're making this referral, but through audit and feedback, we find out that there's actually, that many of them um, aren't actually making the referral, getting a sense of what their actual practice is compared to their perception might be a nice uh, strategy. If there's low interest level, um, sometimes, particularly in clinical work, we've seen that they've provided incentives to encourage implementation. Um, and if there's kind of a, um, there's beliefs and attitudes that aren't in line with kind of adopting and implementing the program, again, a lot of people have taken the strategy of kind of opinion leaders or, or peer influence or champions to kind of help um, shift norms or perceptions about it. So again, there's no, it's, again, this is kind of a mix of art and science. There's no right, one right way, but this is some of the strategies that might map on to barriers to implementation. Um, what we found is as people have started to publish on implementation strategies, we're finding that, you know, you can say that you're doing a training, but training can mean many things. Um, you know, you can provide technical assistance or have a champion, but again, people aren't providing a lot of specificity on what they're actually doing. So um, Byron Powell and Anola Proctor and others have also um, kind of are working towards um, being really specific about, you know, if you're doing an implementation strategy, who's leading it? Who's kind of the actor? What's the action? What's the goal of it? What's the time period? What's the dose? What's the ideal outcome? And why did you select it? So again, just getting a little bit more specific um, because we could publish on training as an effective implementation strategy, but then if someone went to kind of go and replicate that and we didn't include any of this information, they really don't have anything to work with. So really it's about building an evidence base in the field to help us, again, um, kind of move the needle in terms of actually impacting implementation. Um, some of the research questions that we're seeing um, get funded are things like, you know, is a certain set of implementation strategies more effective compared to a stra another strategy or a set of strategies in a certain setting or context? So, you know, are they feasible? Um, do they promote kind of fidelity? Are they delivered over time? Do they have an impact on the health behavior of interest? Are they cost effective? So those are the types of things people are studying. Um, 
what are the mechanisms through which they might impact implementation? So you might actually find that a certain strategy, so having a community champion in these churches might actually encourage a, a successful implementation, um, but you might not know the mechanisms through which it's doing that. Um, so is it through changing resources, building capacity, changing leadership attitudes and norms? Um, or knowledge or self-efficacy. So um, some people are trying to study the mechanisms through which that's happening. Um, and again, which implementation strategies work best for specific interventions and settings. And again, for people doing work in community settings, I think this is critical. We have so many gaps here in terms of what's feasible, acceptable, appropriate for specific populations and settings and contexts. So I think this is a really important area to move forward. We already know a lot about different implementation strategies, so we're often not starting from scratch. So as you can see here, things like the Cochrane Review have a lot of information about kind of the evidence base and how much impact a lot of these strategies have. So again, you're often not starting from scratch in terms of whether or not they're effective, but it's more about understanding if they're effective for your specific context and setting. And again, these are some of those resources for finding information about um, effective implementation strategies if you want to try and justify it kind of, you know, from a research perspective.